Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, this is the uh, continuation to chi square hypothesis uh, test. Okay, now just to uh, recap um, the two main functions um, as to why we use chi square hypothesis test is uh, firstly, uh, we want to check for uh, goodness of uh, fit, right, to see whether uh, uh, a certain standard uh, probability distributions like binomial, geometric, Poisson, uniform, exponential, or normal uh, could be a good fit to the uh, samples that we have uh, collected. Right now, there's a first uh, purpose of using chi-square hypothesis test. Now, secondly, uh, we can also use hypothesis uh, this chi-square hypothesis test to uh, check for um, whether uh, two variables uh, for any uh, research that you are carrying out, whether they are related or not. So we are checking for independency between two variables. Um, one way to uh, capture this independency between two variables, um, here we are uh, applying a contingency uh, table methods uh, to analyze and then to carry out chi-square hypothesis test to check whether these two variables are actually dependent or independent uh, with each other. Right? Now, I'm going to show you uh, more examples um, to look at how we can actually apply um, uh, this chi-square hypothesis test for uh, both of these uh, usage. Right? Now, stay tuned. All right. Now, to perform a uh, chi-square hypothesis test um, uh, to check for goodness of fit uh, for certain standard probability distributions, uh, these are the general guidelines that we always use um, whenever we want to carry out a chi-square hypothesis uh, test here. All right. Now, uh, first of all, we have to determine some of these um, um, quantities before we can actually calculate uh, the chi-square value. Right? Now the first one would be the observe and the expected frequency. Now the observe uh, are all the um, uh, collected uh, sample data um, when you carry out your research. Right? So those are the uh, real physical world data collections or sampling that you need to carry out uh, before you can actually uh, start uh, to check for this um, chi-square hypothesis uh, test here, right? Now, secondly, um, once we have collected the sample, uh, we will have to calculate its uh, theoretical expected frequency uh, based on uh, extra information that we um, that we have, right? Later on, we'll look at how we can, there are various ways to determine uh, expected frequencies here, right? But generally, the uh, simplest formula to calculate the expected frequency is given as such. So n is like number of trials, uh, sample size in this case. Uh, the p would be uh, the probability that um, an element belongs to that category, right? If the null hypothesis is uh, true, we'll look at what that uh, actually mean uh, in our following example, right? <clears throat> and then next, to carry out a chi-square hypothesis testing, we need to uh, tabulate or determine the degree of uh, freedom uh, because uh, this distribution uh, uses degree of freedom to uh, capture the behavior of the uh, data that you have uh, collected. So this degree of freedom is given by uh, k minus 1, where the k represent number of possible outcomes or most of the time it represent categories for that uh, particular experiment. And then lastly, once we have obtained the expected uh, frequency E and then the uh, degree of freedom, we can tabulate uh, the chi-square uh, value. So the chi-square value is given by the sum of uh, this expression here. Um, the ratio of the square between the difference of the observation. The observation usually we label as O, uh, subtract out with the expected uh, frequency uh, uh, divided by E here. Right? So that's how we uh, calculate the uh, chi-square value, the observed uh, chi-square 
uh, value. Once we have obtained that, we're going to compare that with the theoretical critical chi-square value that we can obtain from the theoretical uh, chi-square distributions. And then from there, uh, we can uh, make our uh, informed decision as to whether we are going to ex uh, we are going to uh, accept or we don't have sufficient information to recheck our null hypothesis there. And then most of the time, as a reminder, the null hypothesis uh, always represent uh, a good fitting, right? So for any chi-square hypothesis test um, in the exam for A-level uh, test, so the H0, the null hypothesis, always um, start off with uh, a statement that indicate um, that particular distribution, that particular distribution, uh, distribution is a good uh, fit. So this is our sort of assumption, and then whereby H1 would be um, otherwise, which means the distribution is not a good fit. So that's how we uh, start to write our hypothesis uh, statement, and then by uh, incorporating all this uh, calculation, we can make a sound decisions as to whether we are going to accept our null hypothesis or whether we don't have sufficient information uh, to uh, to accept uh, the uh, null hypothesis. Right? <clears throat> okay. Now, I hope that's clear. We're going to uh, look at a few examples uh, to. Uh, get you into the technical detail as to how to carry out the chi-square hypothesis. Right. right, stay tuned. Right, welcome back. Uh, let's look at our first uh, example as to how we can apply the chi-square hypothesis test um, uh, to check for goodness of uh, fit here. Right now, uh, some of you may have uh, seen this question before, so never mind. Let's read that through one more time. A bank has an ATM installed inside the bank, and it is available to its customers only uh, from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Now, the manager of the bank wanted to investigate if the number of transactions made on this ATM are the same for each of the five days, uh, Monday to Friday of the week. Now, she randomly selected one week and counted the number of transactions made on this uh, ATM on each of the five days uh, during this week. Now, uh, the information she obtained is given in the following table, uh, where the number of users uh, represents the number of transactions on the ATM. Uh, on these days. Now, for convenience, we will refer to this transaction as people or users. All right. So you can look at the result that we obtained here, uh, based on the result that she has recorded. Uh, Monday we have uh, 253, uh, Tuesday 197, uh, Wednesday 204, and then Thursday we have uh, 279, and Friday we have uh, 267 day. Right. Now we want to carry out a chi-square hypothesis test to check um, at the 1% uh, level of significant, are we able to um, uh, sort of uh, reject uh, reject the null hypothesis, or reject the null hypothesis um, that the number of people who use this ATM each of the five days of the week is the same. All right. So we want to see whether we are able to uh, reject, right, or we don't have uh, uh, sufficient information to reject. All right. We will see that uh, in a while. Now, lastly, we have to assume that this week is typically of all weeks in regards to the use of this ATM machine. Now, basically, the last statement. Uh, uh, actually refer to randomization. So all the uh, this sample that she has collected is assumed to be a random sample uh, uh, so that the um, the uh, result is um, would be the best representations of how the outcome would look like on any other days. 
right? <clears throat> okay, now uh, firstly for any types of hypothesis uh, test, we have to write down the hypothesis uh, statement. So here we have our now hypothesis. Now since we are interested to check whether uh, the number of uh, users or number of users are the same for each day over the five uh, days uh, in in the week itself right? so we can uh, use a simple symbol to represent here you can actually write in words uh, saying that um, our now have this would uh, or we can state our null hypothesis as such. We say that um, there is an equal um, number of transactions on uh, each of the five days. There's an equal number of transactions or for each of the five uh, days of the week. Right? Or we can actually write down uh, the proportion, the proportion of transactions uh, are the same for each of the five days. So here we can say that um, number of uh, transaction um, are the same. Are the same uh, for each of the five days. For each of the five days <clears throat> so they they go you can write it in such a way or you can represent it mathematically as such for instance uh, p1 is equal to p2 p3 p4 or p5 All right now if you like p to represent the proportion or the number of transactions on each day, we say that the number of transactions on each day uh, remain the same, okay? Or each one of them have a probability of uh, one over five. So you can actually write it down as one over five like this, right? <clears throat> Whereby uh, H1, H1 will be number of transactions are not the same, right? So in this case, if we use that statement, you will say that number of uh, transactions are not the same right for each of the five day for each of the five days okay you can write in um, using statements or you can say that um, you can say that um, two or more right or you can say that two or more uh, transaction uh, difference right for uh, each of the five uh, days there right so no matter how you write uh, just make sure you are very clear on the uh, objective of your hypothesis uh, test here right Okay, now that's our first step. And then uh, to recall, uh, we will need to tabulate uh, certain um, values before we even start to uh, make an informed decision um, as to whether we have sufficient information to reject our null hypothesis or otherwise. Right? <clears throat> so those informations are, I just uh, write down here to recap. So those informations that we need will be, we need our observation value, uh, those uh, numbers that we have recorded um, through our sample. Okay, those are here. So these are uh, observed uh, values, or you can say the observed frequency in this case. Okay, uh, some textbook prefer to write as uh, O F like this, that is fine. That is the observed frequency. Okay, or you just put in as O, that should be fine. And then secondly, we need to determine the expected, the theoretical expected uh, frequency. Um, if, right, if the probability uh, remain the same, so the proportions or transaction remain the same uh, for 
uh, each of the five days there, which is uh, one fifth. All right. <clears throat> okay. So we need to tablet this. Now in this case, we notice that the uh, um, now if you actually add up all these numbers, which I have already uh, tabulated, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, thousand two hundred. So the expected frequency will be one fifth of uh, one thousand. Uh, 200 which is actually uh, 240 <clears throat> so for each day we would expect to have 240 transaction or users uh, visiting this ATM uh, performing uh, performing any uh, uh, services provided by the bank right. and then uh, next uh, once we have done this yes we can straight away calculate our uh, chi-square value so our chi-square value is calculated based on this uh, formula here e All right now we have to calculate each uh, individual um, expression for this and then we can sum up uh, the whole um, calculation and then that will give us the observed uh, chi-square value and then lastly once we have calculated the observed uh, chi-square observe chi-square maybe we can put it as a, a chi-square O uh, next we begin to refer to uh, your calculator or, or computers or maybe a data booklet for instance uh, MF19 if we are talking about our A level exam here so you can use your MF19 to check for the critical critical chi-square value uh, based on the uh, significant level that you have stated in your experiment. So in this case, we are using a 1% significant uh, level here. All right? What will be its uh, critical um, chi-square value? Other than that, other than this 1%, we also need the degree of freedom uh, before we can tabulate this uh, critical chi-square. So the degree of freedom um, is given by, okay, so degree of freedom in this case you can uh, I think in the data booklet most of the time it is written as V so the degree of freedom is based on the number of categories now the categories we have is uh, five categories here so you will take uh, for instance five minus a one now the one is the restriction uh, that we have um, um, due to the data that we have collected. Now the restriction is uh, the sum, uh, the total frequency remain constant. So that's the restriction. So we cannot change the total uh, frequency here. Therefore we have to um, uh, subtract off this restriction. Therefore you have a uh, uh, degree of freedom equal to uh, 4 there. So in order to calculate this uh, critical chi-square, you will need the degree of freedom okay so i'm going to write it down here you need to have the degree of freedom plus you need to have the significant label all right and then now from there you should be able to tabulate the critical uh, chi-square value and then we can make um, the informed decision all right okay now just a little bit uh theory of how we can actually make an informed decision uh, before we even look at the uh, result itself okay now these are the two values that we have uh, obtained and then uh, using the chi-square distributions so, uh, roughly so chi-square uh, graph usually looks something like this now uh, this is always the right hand tail uh, analysis so your critical value for your chi-square is indicated somewhere here so this is uh, your critical value for your chi-square and then this is your observed um, uh, chi-square value so what happens is that we're going to uh, check and compare whether uh, whether check for instance whether the uh, observed chi-square is um, less than the critical chi-square or whether the uh, observed chi-square is more than so there are two possibilities here whether it's less than or whether it's more than now the region the region on the right uh, to the uh, uh, critical chi-square value is known as rejection zone 
So for instance, if you um, observe, okay, sorry, I think here it should be, if you observe critical, uh, if you observe a chi-square value four in the rejection region, so this is the rejection region, rejection uh, region, so if the chi-square, the observed chi-square value fall in the rejection region, um, then we will have sufficient uh, evidence to reject the now hypothesis. Now, in that event, therefore, we can conclude that um, two or more transactions are different for each of the five days of the week. All right. Now, Otherwise, if your observed chi-square is outside of the rejection zone, outside of the rejection zone, right? Now, uh, therefore, we uh, we will not have sufficient uh, evidence to reject. Uh, therefore, the only way we can do this is to accept, right? To accept the now hypothesis to be true. Therefore, we can uh, conclude that, yeah. Um, for this bank, the uh, number of transactions uh, remain the same uh, for each of the five days uh, in the week itself. Right now, this is the procedures that we are going to uh, go through for any questions uh, where you need to determine goodness of uh, fit here. Right. So let me walk you through one more time. Uh, the first one will be here. You need your hypothesis statement. Uh, next, you need to perform the uh, uh, what I call the analysis uh, sections. So you need to figure out the observe, which you always have uh, as a result of the sampling, and then uh, you must uh, tablet the theoretical expected uh, frequency, and then from there we can uh, compute the. Um, uh, values for the observed chi-square and then after that compare that with the critical chi-square value all right so this is the second step uh, now once we have done the second step then uh, we are going to move on to uh, the conclusion section so how do we conclude we are going to check whether you observe uh, chi-square 4 in the rejection region or whether it's outside of it all right now i do have a student's um, ever ask me if the observed chi-square actually fall exactly um, on the uh, critical chi-square. Uh, therefore, <coughs> uh, should we uh, reject or should we um, accept the now hypothesis? So bear in mind, if it is on, if it is on, we, uh, we will still accept the now. Uh, as long as it's more than uh, which means it should fall in the rejection region completely, then uh, we will have sufficient evidence to reject. Right? Now, I hope that is uh, clear here. All right. Now, uh, next, I'm going to show you all the numbers that we can tabulate uh, automatically. Of course, I, I want to save time uh, on this. So, let me show you what I have here. Uh, first of all, I'm going to show you the step number two. Yeah, step two. Okay, let's look at step two now. <coughs> okay, step two. Let me uh, clean this up. So, okay, uh, there you have it. So step number two. Now uh, we have ob obtained our observed frequency. Here is our observed frequency, and then uh, this is our expected frequency. Okay, so we we expect that each day will have the same transaction. So generally that means uh, that is one fifth of the uh, total, f uh, total sample size. So total sample size is uh, 1,200 here. Right? So let's look at the second one. The second one must be, uh, must be exactly the same there. Right? So that would be 240. There. Right. And then uh, do check uh, both the uh, total frequency for the observed and the expected frequency uh, mass uh, tally. Right. Now that is the uh, the rule. Okay. Now next, uh, in order for us to compute the chi-square value, we need to take the difference here. 
So the difference is basically just uh, the difference between the observed and the expected frequency. And then after that, we're going to take the square of this and then uh, take the ratio between the square of this and the uh, expected frequency. So therefore, we have a 10 hour serve, the first uh, chi-square value, first individual chi-square value. Now, of course, we are not going to stop there. We're going to tablet each one of these. And then the same goal for this. And then lastly, we are going to tablet the uh, each individual chi-square. Okay. And then uh, you can see that the observed, uh, this value they are looking at, the sum, the sum of all the uh, ratio. This is uh, what we call as the uh, observed. So this one is the observed chi-square value. Uh, this is our observed chi-square value based on our sample there. Uh, now, I hope uh, that is clear at this point. Now, next, I'm going to show you the two different ways to do this. The first way is by using um, software. Okay. Of course, uh, we can use this in the exam. Right. So the uh, for the first ones, the software, we have already found that the degree of freedom is actually four because there are five categories. Degree of freedom is a four. And then um, the significant level is 1%. We are looking at the right-hand tail. Uh, so 1% is here. So that is a very small region there. Okay. And then um, we are going to check okay, the critical chi-square value. Before that, let me erase this. The critical chi-square value. So the critical chi-square value is here. This is our uh, critical chi-square value. So this critical chi-square value is given as 13.277 approximately. All right. Now that's how we get it from the software. Itself. With the degree of freedom uh, equal to 4, uh, this is how we calculate our degree of freedom. I hope that is clear. Now, of course, uh, in the exam, there is no way we can actually use the software itself. So that brings us another uh, method to actually determine the critical uh, chi-square value. That is from the uh, MF19 uh, data booklet. Right? Now, under the uh, sections chi-square distributions, Right. Now, bear in mind, uh, our rejection zone is on the right-hand side. But uh, using that, that data booklet, uh, the region uh, shaded here is on the left. Uh, on the right is 1%. So the shaded region here should be 99%. So what we need to do now is uh, look at under... 99% uh, sorry look at under 99% here so this is 99% uh, for the degree of freedom equal to a 4 right now you can see that this is a 4 here uh, 99 degree of freedom 13.28 uh, to be precise you can see that is exactly the same as uh, the computed one from the software so both of these represent the same critical uh, chi-square value. Uh, may you use the software or using the data booklet. Uh, both of them should yield the same result. Uh, the only difference is the uh, number of decimals or the accuracy. Right. Other than that, they are exactly the same. Right. <clears throat> okay. So since we know that the critical value is uh, 13.22, okay. So we are done with this now. It's 13.22. Okay, and then um, our observe. Okay, if you refer back, our observe, um, our observe chi square is twenty three point one eight. Okay, so what what does that uh, mean in this case? All right now, uh, let me show you one more time. Okay, what does that actually mean? So this is our critical chi square, and then the observe. Um, chi-square value is somewhere here is approximately 23 is greater than this is greater than the uh, this one is the uh, observed chi-square so chi observed chi-square is 23 point something which is uh, in the rejection zone 
since this is in the rejection zone, uh, therefore we can conclude that uh, we have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So, all right, full stop. That's a that's the uh, conclusion. And then lastly, of course, you have to conclude based on this context. You will say that uh, number of transactions are not the same for each of the five days there. Right, just to re, uh, restate the alternative hypothesis. All right. Now I hope uh, that is uh, clear how we carry out hypothesis uh, testing. Just follow the step one, step two. Actually, the most important one is step one and step two. Uh, step three is mostly the analysis and then uh, uh, make an informed conclusion. All right. Now I'm going to move on to the second question shortly. All right. Second question, all right. Okay, uh, here in uh, July 23, 2009, Harris Interactive Poll uh, 1015 advertisers uh, were asked about their opinions of Twitter. Now, the percentage distribution of your responses is shown in the following table, all right. So, this is the percentage of your response. Uh, based on option A, B, C, uh, D here, All right? <clears throat> okay. Now, assuming that these percentages hold true for the uh, 2009 uh, populations of advertisers, right? This is this is what uh, we expect uh, to see. Right? Recently, uh, someone has uh, uh, performed a, a, a random sampling uh, to check. Uh, whether this uh, percentage uh, still stay the same here. All right. So uh, our task is to test um, at uh, 2.5 level of significance whether the current uh, distributions of uh, opinions is different from that uh, for 2009 here. Which means uh, the same questions uh, pop up. Is this model uh, you can see that is this distribution model a good fit to the uh, data that we have collected? Uh, that's the uh, key question here. So we are still testing for uh, goodness of uh, fit here. Right. <clears throat> so I hope that's clear. So the first thing is uh, we have to write down our uh, now hypothesis as usual. Right. So the now hypothesis will be, we will say that the current distributions of opinion, current distributions of opinion is uh, the same. All right. Um, from that uh, for 2009. Okay. And then, of course, uh, H1, uh, you will say that the current distribution is different. Of uh, opinion. Um, are different from that for 2009. All right, now that's the first step to step the um, now hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So as usual, the second step, uh, you would be able to recall to, to calculate uh, the observe, uh, sorry, not to calculate the observe, we have already collected the observe. Uh, this part of your observe frequency. Now we need to uh, determine the expected uh, frequency. All right, we need to determine the expected frequency. And then, of course, uh, lastly, we will need to uh, tabulate the observe uh, chi square again. So I'm going to rewrite. Uh, one more time, the formula for this, uh, which is this one here. All right, and then uh, again, uh, we're going to refer to our critical chi-square value, and then um, make a, a statistical 
decision, I would say, right, in this case, as to whether we are going to um, um, see that the current distributions or opinions uh, remain the same or um, difference from that for 2009, right? Mm. Okay, now I'm going to erase off this. I'm going to show you what we are uh, having. So I'm going to remove off this uh, uh, statement here. Okay, uh, I hope that you can you can actually refer to this statement over here, uh, more or less uh, the same here. So uh, maybe I'll just write it down here just for uh, reference. So current uh, distribution. Uh, of opinions remain the same. All right, remain the same uh, from that for uh, 2009. Okay, so that's for reference there. All right. <coughs> All right. Now I'm going to take out the uh, my Excel here, so it's easier to refer. Okay, save time here because the, this uh, tabulations um, is a sort of a standard routine that we need to carry out. Okay, so here we have opinion A, B, C, D. The percentage um, as uh, layout. Uh, according to the interactive poll is 45%, 21%, 17 and 17 here. Now the observe uh, from the sample, we have already uh, determined that is here. And then the expected, okay, what do we expect? Uh, now if this percentage stay true, so we should expect 45% of this value. So 45% of this value is actually 360. So 45%, so 45% of that, meaning that we take 45% uh, by 300, oh sorry, not 370, uh, sorry, my bad here, uh, is 45% of the overall um, sample size. So the sample size is 800, so 45% of 800 here, so you will end up with uh, 374 here and then you can repeat that process uh, until you get all the uh, expected value here uh, you can see that the first expected value 45% uh, of the 800 uh, then the second one is 21% uh, of 800 that's what you have okay so just to recall the formula that we are using is E equal to NP. So the P uh, is stated by this uh, percentage here. The N is the sample size. All right, that's how we tabulate this. And then uh, as usual, we just need to repeat the same routine here to obtain all these uh, differences and then uh, the square of this. And then finally, we can uh, calculate its uh, observed uh, chi-square value. So from what we see, the observed chi-square value is 5.42. Right. So the observed uh, chi-square value is 5. Point, so here, I'm going to write it down. So this one is the observed chi-square value is 5.42. Okay, 5.42. Now next, we're going to use uh, a software, of course, just to check. So using software, oh yeah, by the way, I forgot uh, to mention that. Um, in order to get the chi-square, uh, critical chi-square value, other than the um, 1%, oh, sorry, not 1% in this case, it's 2.5% significant level, we must also tabulate its uh, degree of freedom. So degree of freedom, uh, which is given by V, is... Um, number of category subtract off with the restriction that we have so in this case we have four categories so therefore your degree of freedom is equal to three degree of freedom is three um, now significant level is 2.5 percent uh, therefore the critical chi-square value would be okay so the critical chi-square value is given by 9.35 approximately 
uh, whereby our observe uh, uh, chi square value is 5.42 uh, 5.42 so therefore uh, this critical value uh, sorry this critical value is uh, here so this is critical and then um, our observe is somewhere here our observe is 5. Point something so 5. Point something is over here now this part is our observe chi square you can see that our observed chi square is located outside of the rejection region. Uh, therefore, we uh, does not have sufficient evidence to reject to reject our null hypothesis. Therefore, we can conclude that the current distribution of the opinions remain the same from that for uh, the year two thousand nine percentage. Okay. I hope that is clear. Of course, uh, as usual, for exam purpose, you uh, have to refer to your uh, data booklet. Okay, so let's uh, try to refer to the data booklet. Uh, now for 2.5%, uh, so the rejection region, which means if you refer to your data booklet, the 2.5% is actually this uh, section. So this is 2.5%. Okay, so 2.5 percent. Then this uh, shaded region must be uh, 97.5. So we are supposed to look at 97.5, 975, and then under degree of freedom equal to three. So 9.7 try. So here you can see that uh, this value is 9.348, which is uh, 9.35 to be precise. That will be our critical uh, chi square value. And then we will use this to make the same uh, conclusions. All right. Now I hope uh, that is clear. Okay. If you are okay, we are going to move on to the third question. All right. Let's look at our third question here. Um, to check for goodness of fit for uniform distribution. Okay, now this is always uh, that um, questions that we wanted to ask ourselves: Are uh, the dyes that we are using uh, bias or non-bias? All right. So uh, this person here, Yong, claims that the uh, dyes he is using are fair. Okay. So his friend throws the dyes a uh, total one hundred twenty times, uh, and then collected this uh, sample here. All right. Now by using this observe frequency, we are going to check. Uh, whether uh, the die is a fair dice or whether uh, the die is a biased dice. Right? <clears throat> so the question is, do these figures provide evidence that the dice are biased or is this uh, just the level of variation you would expect uh, to occur naturally? Right? Clearly, a formal statistical test is required, of course. All right? Now, to make our analysis um, smooth, here we will make assumptions that we are using 1% uh, uh, significant. Right? Significant level or level of uh, significant uh, for our reference here. Right? You can use any level of significance uh, based on uh, the requirement of your uh, research here, right? <clears throat> now, um, as usual, we will need to write down our um, hypothesis uh, statement. So here we will say that uh, we want to check is there any evidence that our dyes are biased, right? <clears throat> so first of all, we will say that uh, our, our dyes is fair, okay? So the dyes um, are fair or uh, non bias or you can say that uh, is uh, non bias or mathematically you can say that the probability of uh, one number appear on top uh, would always be uh, one six in this case right. <clears throat> whereas uh, the uh, alternative hypothesis would be if you use this then you will say that oh, okay so therefore uh, the the probability of one number appearing would not be the same as uh, one six. It could be more, it could be less. Uh, doesn't matter as long as it is not the same. Then we'll say that the dice is biased, or the this this part here basically means uh, dice uh, bias. 
All right, then that's how we state our uh, hypothesis statement. Okay, now secondly, we're going to uh, use all the observed frequency that we can get. Okay, just let me show it to you here. So you can see that this is uh, the score that we have. Okay, uh, the order doesn't matter. And then uh, we have the observation. So this is the observed frequency. Just to check whether I got all, all the numbers correct. And then the expected frequency. Uh, yeah. Uh, what we expected is, okay, just to highlight that one more time. So expected is calculated based on NP. So the N here refer to the uh, sample size. So the number of trials in this case. And then multiply by the uh, probability that we expect uh, a non-biased uh, dyes would give us. So that would be uh, one six. Uh, 1 over 6 of 120. So if the dice is fair, then it should produce all, all the same expected um, frequency then, right? Then we will go through all the calculations on this and then sum up. So don't forget we have to sum up all this, sum them up, and then this value here that we have 10 is uh, what we call the observed um, observe uh, chi-square value. So our observed chi-square value, I'm going to write it down here, is 11.50. That's our observed uh, chi-square value. Right. Now, other than that, other than that, uh, don't forget, um, is an exam requirement to check whether the expected frequency if there's any individual expected frequency that is less than 5. If it's less than 5, uh, then we will have to um, do a bit of adjustment. We might have to uh, add the, um, the data that is less than, uh, that has a expected frequency less than 5 with other rows of data that have uh, other expected frequency so that the sum of those two uh, data would uh, produce an expected frequency more than 5. Uh, if this is equal to 5, that is fine. Uh, but it cannot be less than 5 there. Right? <clears throat> now, in this case, we are quite lucky because the expected frequency are all greater than uh, 5 here. So we don't really need to worry about that. Now, next, uh, of course, here you can use your calculator. Uh, before you use your calculator, uh, always work out the degree of uh, freedom here yeah the degree of uh, freedom okay so the degree of freedom in this case degree of freedom All right so or sometimes you write dof okay for me i like to use v instead uh, if you want to use dk that is uh, fine we have a uh, six category and then uh, one restriction, of course, there's only one restriction here. So therefore, degree of freedom is equal to a five here. Now, therefore, we are going to, uh, this time I will, I will show the data booklet instead of the cal calculator itself. <clears throat> so by using the uh, data booklet, uh, all we need to do is go to the degree of freedom five. And then since we're using 1% significant level, uh, then this uh, region here represent 1%. Uh, this shaded region must be 99%. So we are supposed to look for 99% over here. And then that will give us um, the critical. So from here, we have found that the critical chi-square value is 15.09. Okay, 15.09. So if I were to draw that, uh, chi-square result out. Okay, so take for instance, we have something like this. Our critical value is uh, somewhere here. That is 15.09. And then way by our observe. Our observe is uh, somewhere here. Our observe is 11.50. Now, since the observe um, chi-square value is not in the rejection region. Uh, therefore, we can conclude that um, the dyes are fair, or you can say that the probability of each number appearing uh, will remain as uh, 1 over 6. 
All right. So I hope that is clear at this point. Okay. Now, of course, in the exam, you have to construct. Don't forget, you have to construct the table manually. So this requires a bit of work, right? <clears throat> okay. Now I'm going to move on to the next question shortly. All right. Question four, uh, testing the goodness of fit for Poisson distribution. Okay. Now Poisson distributions, you can refer to my um, um, another video on uh, the general idea what is a Poisson uh, distributions. So Poisson distribution is a discrete uh, distribution. You can read that up uh, if you are not sure uh, some of the properties of Poisson distribution. Right. <clears throat> Now let's read through this question here. The number of telephone calls uh, made to a counseling service is thought to be molded by Poisson distribution. So we might expect that Poisson distributions would be a good fit for the sample data that we have uh, collected here. So the data are collected on the number of calls received during one hour period. Oh, okay, so uh, the initial idea of Poisson distribution is uh, mainly to model um, any discrete numbers of uh, events that occur over a certain period of time. So this uh, sounds like or might be a good fit, right? Since we are referring to number of calls received over a certain period of time. All right. So these are the data collected. Uh, use the data to test at 5% significance level whether the Poisson uh, model is appropriate. Okay. Now, the first part is always to write down the uh, hypothesis statement. So we'll say that, yes, uh, Poisson uh, model. Okay, Poisson model is a good fit. Uh, you can say that Poisson model is a good fit, or you can say that Poisson model is appropriate. Okay, doesn't uh, matter here. Okay, so the second one will be Poisson model is not appropriate. All right, so there you go. Uh, that is our first step, uh, identifying the objective of this uh, test. Okay, secondly, we're going to carry out the uh, standard routine. Okay, here I have already prepared the uh, data here uh, to speed up our discussion. All right, now you can see that we have zero uh, number of calls per that uh, time frame. And then uh, the observed frequency, instead of using all, instead you can write F, F or also can, doesn't matter. Okay. So I'm just using a different um, notation here. You can use whatever notation you like. These are the observed uh, frequency. So this is what we have. And then uh, now, uh, before we can continue with the uh, second step, okay, um, here is the uh, recap on how Poisson distributions uh, works or what are the properties for Poisson distribution. To work with Poisson distributions, uh, okay, if we label X uh, to represent, let's uh, call this uh, X represent um, number, okay, number of calls receive, um, receive over uh, one hour period. Okay, one hour period. Okay, so let X be the uh, this uh, representation. So therefore, the Poisson distribution is uh, must have this uh, lambda as its parameter. So the lambda is the average number, average number of calls. Uh, over that one hour period. Okay. Are we given the information? We are not. So therefore, we have to estimate this. We have to estimate this parameter. So this is uh, the parameter uh, that need to be estimated. So we need to estimate this from our sample. So how, how do we estimate this? Because the lambda represents the average number of calls which means we have to get the average number of calls from this 
uh, data that we have collected. So how do we get the average number of call? Now I hope that um, you guys still, still remember. So if we label this as X, this is F. So the average call, you can say that the uh, estimated uh, average call, so the average call here is given by the mean formula here. So we are going to use this formula to work out uh, the average call. So here I have already calculated that. So you can see this is uh, x multiplied with this. And then we get a total of 155. So here I can write down 155 here, which is this part. And then the total frequencies that we are uh, looking at is uh, 70 is given here. So from there, you can actually uh, calculate that. Now, I have also uh, determined the value here. So you can see that the value is actually 2.214 uh, for ease of analysis, 2.214. Right now, this one will be our estimate for this parameter. So here we can say that, all right, now our lambda is estimated to be 2.214. Now that's the first uh, step. Okay. <clears throat> so once you are ready with this, yes. Uh, now we need to recall back the uh, the uh, probability formula for Poisson distribution. So the probability formula, or sometime in the statistical literature, is called PMF. Uh, this is just for extra learning. It's not required in your exam. This is a probability mass function. So the probability mass function is uh, basically just a probability. Right? It's given by uh, this formula here. Uh, x factorial, uh, where the x are all uh, integer numbers or discrete numbers, right? <clears throat> and so on and so forth. Right? So we can, we're going to use this to calculate each individual, each individual probability. So here I have already done so. So you can see that uh, this is how we calculate the uh, individual probabilities. Take for instance, uh, for x equal to zero. Now if you want to calculate p x equal to zero, all you need to do is just put x equal to zero. x equal to zero is basically just one. So that is e lambda. We have our lambda, 2.214 divided by uh, zero factorial. So that would actually give us E negative 2.214. And then from there, you should be able to obtain this uh, 0 0.1092 as its uh, probability. Okay. And then you're going to repeat that for each one of these uh, individual probability. Okay. And then uh, once you are done, we can calculate the um, expected frequency. So the expected frequency is given by the NP. Uh, NP. So this is our P. Our N is a total of uh, 70. There. So you can see that a total of uh, 70. There, right? So we will take this probability multiply with uh, this 70. So you will get uh, 7.65 and so on and so forth. Okay, now that will be our observed, uh, sorry, expected frequency. All right, now I hope that's clear. Okay, so once you have done with that, okay, all we need to do is go through the same procedure, obtain the difference, and then calculate the uh, each individual chi square. And then uh, finally, we should be able to um, obtain the observed uh, chi square. So here I'm going to sum up all this. Okay, so the observed chi-square uh, for this uh, context is uh, given by this. So that is our observed uh, chi-square. So this is observed um, chi-square, which is 6.03. So we're going to use this and compare that to the critical uh, chi-square value. As usual, before we can obtain the critical chi-square value, we must uh, check few things before we even uh, start to uh, 
uh, compare that. Yeah? Now you can see that you will get very excited to just go ahead and check this. All right? But, but, okay, let me recap one more time. Uh, after you've done first step, yes, well done, hooray. And then the second step, uh, second step will be somewhere here. Yes, uh, hooray, yes, correct. Then the third step, uh, the third step is here. Uh, tabulating all this. Yes, hooray. Okay, but the, the fourth step is also critical. The fourth step is you have to check whether your expected frequency, any individual expected frequency that is less than five. Yeah, you can see that. Okay, this is good. This is good. Check, 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 check. This is good. I'm very happy. Okay, now these two are not very good. You can see that uh, both of them is actually less than. Okay, this is a problem. Uh, if they are less than, you cannot uh, proceed by using this uh, observe chi square. So there's a one reminder there. All right. So don't get too excited to just calculate this. Always uh, go through step number four. So step four is super super important. Okay, so step four, check the expected frequency. If there's any expected frequency that is less than five, oh, we found that yes, uh, there are some that is less than five. There are two uh, that are less than five. So therefore, we cannot use this uh, chi square value yet. Therefore, I have already prepared another uh, worksheet on this. We are going to add these two value up. So we're going to add these two up. Uh, hold on, just let me show it clearer. So we're going to add these two values up uh, to obtain a accumulated expected frequency. And then at the same time, if you add this up, uh, indirectly, indirectly, uh, one row has been removed. So therefore, these two rows will combine together. And then the observed frequency will also combine. So these are the columns that you need to modify. Mm -hmm. Right, and then uh, finally, we can uh, tabulate our uh, observed chi square. Now, of course, at, at this point in time, you you uh, you also argue with me the uh, the observed uh, chi square will not change. Of course, the observed chi square would not change at this point, right? even though if you join uh, the two rows together, but. Uh, what will change is the critical chi square, right? Now we will see that uh, in in a while. Just let me show you the um, the worksheet that I have combined these two values. So I'm going to show you here. Okay, so you can see that uh, I have already joined five and six together. So I have joined this five and six together. Okay, so I have joined this. To become a uh, one, and then the observed frequency I need to uh, sum it up in this case. Okay, so this is this is actually five and six to be precise. Uh, to be precise. Okay, so that should be a five and six in this case, right? <clears throat> so it's better to write uh, here. I don't want to mess up with my formula here. So uh, the correct way uh, to do this is you have to label this as five. Comma six, uh, because it's a join. It's a join two rows together, so you get a five and six together. This is also join. Okay, um, this this section is no longer that important. Uh, now, once you join, you can see that yes, it's more than five now. Uh, we are quite happy with uh, with that, right? So from here. Uh, we should be able to obtain the um, chi square that um, that we expect to get for our observed uh, chi square value. All right. Just let me uh, check for a while in case um, in case I miss out something there. All right. I noticed that there's a change in my chi square value. Hold on. So previously was this. So if I add up these two, hold on, just let me 
check that out. So in this case, I have um, here, I have uh, <clears throat> these two add up together. Okay, hold on, just let me check. All right. Okay, so I have already checked. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Now, uh, previously I have mentioned that uh, some of you might argue that uh, by combining these two rows together, five and six, we might um, end up with the same chi square. Yeah, that's what we expect to get, right? So, uh, but you found that in our in my next uh, worksheet, right? The uh, the new chi square is no longer the same as uh, six here. Yeah. So I, I think some of you uh, would be able to uh, find out as to why. Eh? You can see that because uh, you have combined these observed frequencies to be four, and then at the same time the uh, new, the new uh, expected frequency is five point something. So therefore, the difference between the observed and the expected would yield a different value. Because it yield a different value, uh, therefore. The theoretical conclusion is yes, there will be a change in the uh, observed chi square. So I need to make this clear so that you don't confuse with this. So once you join, once you join or restructure the um, the table itself, the, the tabulated value, yes, the chi square value will change. All right now, I hope that is clear. Let me show you uh, what is the final change here. You can see that from the next worksheet yeah so once you combine these two together uh, you have a new uh, expected frequency and then therefore you have a new uh, differences therefore your final observed chi-square uh, this one will be your final observed chi-square value so here yeah this one will be our final observed uh, chi-square value here right now let me repeat one more time uh, we will go through step one as usual to set uh, our objective then we will go through step number two uh, to tabulate any uh, missing informations before we can um, calculate the chi-square value now step three is to calculate the chi-square value at the same time you should also uh, observe that if uh, there is any individual expected frequency that is less than five if they are you must uh, join uh, join um, uh, join the data together to form uh, or to produce uh, expected frequency more than five there. Therefore, there will be a change in the final chi-square, uh, observed chi-square value. Right? So this one will be, uh, check one more time if there's anything less than five. Okay, none. And then we can accept this as our final observed chi-square here. Right? <clears throat> okay, now I hope that is clear. Okay, and then the final step, step number five. Okay, step five is not uh, tough now. Okay, based on five percent uh, significant level. So five percent significant level. Uh, what we need uh, for step five would be uh, we have our uh, significant level. So therefore, we have to figure out the um, degree of freedom. So the degree of freedom is not calculated based on the category that you look at in the original table, but in the table that you have uh, already modified. So here you can see you have one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six category, six category. And then uh, to obtain the degree of freedom, you have to take into account the restriction. Yes, we have one restriction as usual. And then don't forget, other than the restriction, you must also check if there is any, if there is any estimated uh, parameters. So there is an estimated parameter, so therefore you have to include uh, that uh, estimated parameter also. So therefore your, your final degree of freedom would be equal to a 4 instead of 5. Right. Now I hope that is uh, something uh, difference as compared to uh, the rest right. <clears throat> and then once you are satisfied with this and then your um, significant labor is alpha which is 5% uh, then we are ready to uh, make a conclusion right so let's refer to the MF19 okay 
we are looking at 5%, so this region must be 95%. We can look at under the column 95%, where is the 95%? It's over here. It is 95%. Degree of freedom equal to 4. So this is degree of freedom, uh, 4, and then 95%. So there you have it. Uh, that will be our uh, critical uh, chi-square value. So the critical chi-square value is um, 9.5 approximately, 9.5. Okay, so it's 9.5. Since 9.5 is greater than 4.4, it's greater than 4.4, uh, right? Now uh, just to show you how it actually looks like, so let's pop this up so that it's easier for us to refer here. So take for instance, uh, our degree of freedom is uh, 4, so I'm going to change that to 4. Okay, and then uh, we are looking at the uh, significant levels of 5%. Okay, so 5% there. Therefore, our critical value is uh, 9.5 here. And then our observe, our observe uh, frequency that we have already calculated is actually 4.4, approximately 4.4. Uh, this is our observed uh, chi-square. It's way outside of the rejection region. So therefore, uh, we don't have sufficient evidence to reject um, our null hypothesis. Therefore, we conclude that poison model is a good fit for the sample that we have collected. All right. Now, I hope that is clear here. All right. I'm going to move on to the next uh, example shortly. All right, example number five. Okay, uh, is yet another um, check on goodness of fit for binomial distribution. Now, how different is this example as compared to the previous one? We will uh, look this through. Right now, an egg uh, packaging firm has uh, introduced a new box for its eggs. Now, each box uh, holds six. X. So each box can uh, contain six X. Unfortunately, it finds that the, the new box uh, tends to mark the X. All right. Now data on the number of X marked in 100 boxes uh, are collected. 100 boxes are collected. All right. So this is the result. So number of X uh, marks from 0 to uh, 6 there. So number of boxes that have this marking is recorded uh, here. Okay, it's recorded here. Right? Now it is thought that the distribution may be modeled by a binomial distribution. So we need to carry out the same chi-square test at 0.5% significant level to determine whether the data can be modeled by using binomial distribution. So as usual, we'll start off by going through the first uh, hypothesis statement. So we'll say that, uh, yes, uh, binomial distribution so my binomial distribution um, can be uh, or is appropriate is a good model for instance uh, for the sample that we are collected and then uh, of course we will say that binomial distribution is not a good fit or is not a good model for instance all right <clears throat> okay so we are ready on this all right now uh, to recap okay now as, as usual we finish our step one so steps two is critical because we are checking, we are trying to check whether the binomial distribution is a good fit. So we have to pull all the information we know about uh, binomial distributions. Yeah. So first of all, um, let's, let's use the uh, x. It's a, uh, it's a random variable that represent, um, represent the number of x being uh, marked in each of the hundred boxes, for instance. So therefore, uh, this is a binomial distribution 
with okay with the n okay this n is super important uh, because the marking is on the six x or on each box so we are talking about each box that has six x there so they will make a marking on the six x right so how many so here they want to find out that the new box uh, tends to mark the x so how many uh, new box have the mark x in this case right. <clears throat> so the the n these binomial distributions uh, come with the parameter n and p uh, now the n that we are talking about is actually the 6x there it's not the sample size it's the number of trials so the number of trials is from here this is n number of trials this is sample size so number of trials and sample size are different in this case so therefore we write down six here and then do we know the probability of success like how successful um, are those uh, mark x being spotted for instance okay right okay so you think about that so how many of the new box tends to have the uh, mark on the x is okay so this is what we have so we miss out a parameter for our binomial distribution which is p so therefore we need to estimate this again so this one we need to estimate estimate this we need to estimate this parameter okay how do we estimate this parameter we know that the mean the mean for binomial distributions uh, the mean or the average in this case is actually given by NP uh, is actually given by NP here All right. so the uh, the N is uh, 6 here the N is 6 and then uh, P is here but do I know how to get the mean from the sample itself? so I can find out the mean from the sample that I have so here I have already sort of calculated so this mean is the same as just let me write it down here it's the same as fx all right so we're going to tablet this from uh, my worksheet here so this is um, five okay let's look at five here all right <clears throat> so you can see that from this uh, worksheet uh, the same thing i'm going to go through the same uh, tabulation here okay so from here uh, this is what i have uh, the sum of the fx is uh, 3 4 5 and then the sum of uh, frequency is 100 of course uh, no doubt this is quite an easy calculation so 3.45 now that will be our mean 3.45 but we are interested to estimate the parameter probability success p uh, therefore p can be estimated as um, 3.45 divided by uh, 6 there, right so therefore that will be like um, 6 5 9 I think it should be 5 9 let me see yeah should be 5 9 let me check whether I got it correct in case I miss uh, calculate did I get the uh, uh, six five six nine right mm, okay hold on just let me check if I got this uh, correctly three point four five which is um, this number divided by six mm -hmm, is zero point five seven five something wrong with my mental calculation okay just let me check one more time uh, zero point uh, okay why uh, why is that so hold on let me see what's went wrong here hmm interesting okay just let me check check this through uh, 
Uh, I can't believe that this is 3.45 divided by 6. 45 divided by 6. Uh, okay, there must be my mental math. Okay, so I'm going to use this as the answer here. Uh, my bad. Sorry for my calculation here. So that will be, yeah, really my bad. Okay. I, I think I'm getting uh, <laughs> a little tired now. Okay, uh, never mind. I have recalculated uh, mentally. Yes, it's 0 0.575. Uh, always check uh, thoroughly. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, there's a probability uh, missing parameter that we have estimated from the sample of data that we have uh, collected. So once we are ready with this, uh, then therefore we can uh, write down our estimated uh, binomial distribution as 6. 0.575 here and then by using this we can calculate uh, we can calculate each individual uh, probability that corresponds to uh, 0x be marked 1x be marked and so on and so forth so the uh, binomial the probability uh, mass function is given by uh, such I hope that uh, you still remember so in this case it is um, C6x 0.575 to the power x and then uh, the probability of uh, um, failure will be a 4 to 5 here to the power of 6 minus x uh, where the x uh, range from a 0 until uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 there. Right, so from here we can tablet each one of these uh, here. So you can tablet that. So each probability corresponds to this uh, x value here. So I hope that is clear. Okay, so once you are happy with this, uh, then we can calculate the uh, expected frequency. So expected frequency is, uh, it looks very similar like MP, you know, but there's a, a bit of uh, confusion here. So instead of not confuse ourselves, maybe I'll write down the sample size as a capital letter N. So therefore the expected, uh, expected frequency um, should be calculated as using the sample size uh, multiplied by the probability that we have calculated uh, here. So therefore, you will take this value here and then uh, multiply it with the uh, uh, total number of boxes that we have, which is 100. So that's how we uh, obtain this. Okay. And then there you have it. it. It does tally 100. Okay, we should be very happy at this point. Right? Uh, but this is, uh, where are we now? Okay, this is step one. Yep, we are happy with that. Okay, step uh, two, we are quite happy with that. Uh, step three, uh, tabulating this uh, number until we get the expected frequency. Yeah, we are quite happy with that. Uh, step number four, okay, this is critical. Step number four is the most important uh, step of all. Okay, that is to check whether the any individual expected frequency that is actually less than five. Okay, let's do the checking here. We found that. Oops. This is less than five. This is less than five. This is also less than five. Wow, there are like uh, three sets of data that's less than five. Therefore, we can actually combine these uh, two rows together. Because you can see that if you combine these two rows together, uh, the expected frequency must be more than uh, five now. And then, uh, of course, we have to combine uh, the last two. Now, some of you are wondering, how do I combine uh, rows together? You always combine the rows that is uh, closer to the data that has a uh, expected frequency less than five. There. Okay. All right. So I hope that is uh, clear. I'm going to clean this up, and then I'm going to show you the combined uh, result here. So the combined result is it going up? Okay. So combined result is here. So once you combine that, uh, you will find that uh, here, just let me make it smaller a bit so it's easier to see. So the expected frequency uh, here, once you combine, you can see that all the expected frequency are more than zero. So once we combine, you will notice that this becomes zero and one. This becomes five and six now. 
because 5 and 6 are uh, combined and then 0 and 1 uh, combined. So once you combine, the observed frequency becomes 6. Then uh, if you combine this, the observed frequency is 28. Okay. And then you go through the same procedure and then finally we will uh, be able to obtain our observed chi-square. Okay, 23.8. Uh, six now. Okay, I hope this is clear. Okay, now step number five is the easiest step now. First, uh, step number five. Okay, step number five, we know our significant level, so therefore all we need to do is find out our degree of freedom. Now, since we estimated one, uh, we have to calculate how many rows we have, how many category. One, two. This is one. This is two, this is three, this is four, this is five. You only have five categories. First of all, uh, we estimated one, which is here. Okay, so just let me highlight this. So this is estimated from here. And then uh, finally, of course, you need to uh, remove the restriction. So therefore, uh, your uh, final degree of freedom would be a three. Okay. Degree of freedom of 3, significant level of 0 0.5, and then therefore by referring to the MF19. Okay, uh, we have to look under um, this one, will be 99.5. So it should be 99.5 here, and then a degree of freedom number 3 here. So that would actually give us 12.83. Uh, um, yeah, 12.83. Okay, let me show you. The graph where we are this is 23 so just let me write it down some way uh, or else I will forget about this number 23.86 okay cool <clears throat> all right now let me get the software up so that it's easier to see here okay now you can see that um, the degree of freedom is um, 3 and then the um, significant level is uh, 0.05 here okay so therefore our critical value our critical value is somewhere here is too far um, to the right already so that is 12.84 approximately uh, this is your critical chi-square and then our observed chi-square is even worse. Our observed chi-square is right in the rejection region. So our observed uh, chi-square is 20, 23.9, which is found in the rejection region. Therefore, therefore, uh, we have sufficient evidence to uh, reject our now hypothesis. Right? Of course, for exam purpose, you can use the word uh, reject the uh, now hypothesis in this case and then uh, since we reject the now hypothesis therefore binomial distribution is not a good fit all right now I hope uh, that is clear in this case okay all right I'm going to move on to the next example shortly all right welcome back uh, example six uh, okay uh, check for goodness of fit for proportion okay now it is generally believed that a uh, particular uh, genetic defect is carried by 10% of people. A new and simple test becomes available to determine whether somebody is, carrier, is, is a carrier of this uh, defect uh, using a blood specimen. As uh, part of a research project, 100 hospitals are asked to carry out uh, this uh, test anonymously on the next 30 blood samples they take. So the results are shown below here. Right. <clears throat> okay, now bear in mind, uh, here we can see that number of positive uh, tests, number of uh, positive tests. Okay, now you can see that this is something like the uh, uh, number of trials. So number of trials we are looking at is uh, 30 here. So 30 is the number of trials whereby the, the total sample size is given by uh, 100 hospitals here. Okay, so the question is, do these figures 
support the model that 10% of the people carry this effect. So first of all, uh, we will start off by writing the uh, policy statement one more time. Okay, so here we will say that, uh, yeah, the model, you can use any uh, uh, wording that fit this description. Now you can say that the model that 10% um, of uh, people um, carry this uh, defect is uh, it's a good fit right the model that 10% of the people carry this uh, defect is uh, is appropriate for instance or it's a good fit uh, however you like to uh, write that and then of course uh, the model that 10% of uh, people carry uh, this defect is not uh, appropriate <coughs> okay so there you have it those are our first step okay uh, then the second step uh, since this is a proportion since they mentioned the percentage uh, now it's either 10% of them carry this defect or or 90% of them does not carry so this is like yes or no uh, success or failure uh, situation so that gives us an idea that this must be another binomial uh, distribution okay so therefore if x represent uh, the number of uh, uh, positive uh, tests positive cases here uh, that will be a binomial distribution uh, with a trial number of trials uh, 30 sample uh, this is actually 7 plus and above right? so 30 sample and then with a uh, uh, probability of uh, success of course a uh, probability of success in this case you're wondering hmm, should I estimate this probability of success uh, one more time or not okay now are we given the probability of success in our now hypothesis that is the uh, uh, big questions there yeah we are so we don't really need to uh, in this case we don't really need to uh, estimate this this has been given if we have no idea what is the probability of success yes we have to estimate that. but since we are given uh, then we are good with this <coughs> okay so once we're done with this uh, then all we need to do is uh, just plug into the uh, binomial distributions uh, formula uh, that is given by uh, what do we have here c30 uh, x here uh, 0 0.1 um, x 0 0.9 to the power of 30 minus x okay so x is from 0, 1, and so on and so forth. 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth. All right. <clears throat> so I hope that is clear at this point. Okay. Once you are ready, all we need to do is just tabulate all this uh, information. So let me get that uh, information ready. Uh, this is, uh, hold on. Okay, 6 here. Okay. This is our 6. So we can tabulate this. Uh, we have all this information here. You can see the number of tests. Uh, observe frequency. We have that. Uh, next, we are going to calculate uh, each individual probability uh, as uh, such shown by this equation here, this formula. So we will be able to tabulate all its probability. And then after that, we are going to calculate the expected frequency. Expected frequency is um, let me write it down here uh, in case you're wondering what is expected frequency so the FE in, in, in our case is the 100 multiplied by each individual uh, probability so that would actually give us um, this multiply with the total 100 uh, you can see that there is just 4.24 um, approximately and then you will get that uh, expected frequency 
Okay, so step one, just to check again in exam. Step one, pass. Step two, pass. Okay, step three, uh, which is the tabulation of the expected frequency, pass. Uh, step four, uh, step four is the most important one, to check for FE, uh, bear in mind, to check for FE. Is there any expected frequency that is less than 5? Uh, we found that yes, 1, less than 5, this is less than 5, this is less than 5. But we can actually join these two together, of course. Yeah, we can join these two together. Definitely it's going to uh, exceed. Uh, and then we're going to ex uh, join this, these two together. And then that would actually uh, bring us uh, anything more than five. Then, all right. So I hope that is clear. <coughs> now I'm going to show you the worksheet that I have uh, combined them together, so it's easier for us to see here. Okay. So these are the combined. So if you join zero and one together, so we get that observed frequency uh, six plus six, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on and so forth. So this is our new um, expected. Uh, frequency and then as usual we're going to tabulate the difference it shouldn't be that uh, tough and then finally we're going to tabulate its um, observe uh, observe a uh, chi-square value so you will see that the observed chi-square value is 39.74 uh, here okay so I hope that is clear here and check one more time if we miss on anything all right we are we are not okay so we have done step number four now we have to go to step number five now step number five is to check the critical uh, chi-square so we have to get uh, the degree of freedom mm, now again go back to your final uh, table structure one two three four five six so you have six category uh, we don't have anything estimated in this case, but we do have one restriction. So therefore, your degree of freedom is a 5. Um, the alpha or the significant level is a 5%. So once you have done this, uh, we are ready. We are going to refer to our MF19. Okay. I'm going to refer to the MF19 here. Okay. Okay. So MF19. Uh, now from here we are supposed to look at um, we're supposed to look at 95 percent so 95 percent uh, degree of freedom equal to 5 so degree of freedom is 5 95 uh, percent so we found that the uh, critical chi square is 11.07 whereby um, I'm going to write it down here so our observed chi square is 39.7 whereby our uh, critical uh, chi-square is 11.07 here so from here is pretty clear that we can uh, conclude it uh, directly but before that just let me show you the result that we have so we have degree of freedom 5 we are taking a um, significant level of 5% okay uh, there you have it. Um, the um, what do we have here? Our critical uh, chi square is eleven point one, for instance, approximately. Okay, eleven point one, and then uh, our observe, our observe is thirty nine. Observe uh, chi square is thirty nine point seven here, which is uh, found in the rejection zone. So therefore, uh, we have sufficient evidence to reject our null hypothesis. Therefore, the model that 10% of the people carry the defect is not an appropriate model for us to use. All right. Now, I hope that is clear. All right. Okay. I'm going to move on uh, to the um, next uh, purpose of using this. Um, uh, chi square test instead of using that to perform uh, a check on goodness of fit we can also use that uh, to check for independency between two variables all right so we're going to go on to that all right 